Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to the New Books in Russian and Eurasian Studies. I'm your host, Jennifer Yeremeyeva. More than 75 years has passed since the end of World War II, but the conflict remains very present in the hearts and minds of the Russian people. My guest today, Professor David Hoffman, suggests that this is no accident, but rather a deliberate effort on the part of the leadership of Russia to put the Great Patriotic War, as it's known in Russia, at the center of the nation's identity and use it as a powerful unifying force. Professor Hoffman is the editor of and one of the contributors to a new collection of essays entitled The Memory of the Second World War in Soviet and Post-Soviet Russia, published this, published this year by Rutledge. Having witnessed the resurgence of enthusiasm for commemorations of the Great Patriotic War in Moscow from 2000 onward, I found these essays both thought-provoking and particularly relevant given recent heightened tensions between NATO and Russia. While the memory of the Second World War in Soviet and post-Soviet Russia offers 15 outstanding academic essays on topics as varied as gender, roles in war memorials to coverage of war-related topics in Russia's regions, I suspect that the collection will be of interest to a much wider audience outside of academia, because each of these 15 essays unlocks important motivations behind past and current Russian thinking and behavior. And I'm looking forward to getting into these and many other questions today with Professor David Hoffman, who is Ohio State University's College of Arts and Sciences Distinguished Professor. And he's also the editor of The Memory of the Second World War in Soviet and Post-Soviet Russia. Professor Hoffman, welcome back to the New Books Network. Thank you very much, Jennifer. It's a real pleasure to be interviewed by you for this podcast. I've really enjoyed listening to the other podcasts that you've done. And I'm, in fact, very grateful to you and to all the NBN interviewers, as well as to Marshall Poe, the, the founder of the New Books Network. Oh, well, thank you for that. We we um, we enjoy the work that we do, and Marshall leads us with great aplomb. Um, so let's get started. Um, before we jump into the actual meat of the book, I wonder if you could share with our listeners your own academic career and your journey through Russian studies. Yeah, sure. Um, it's somewhat surprising that I became a historian. I really had no interest in history during high school. I found it kind of boring. I started out college as a math major. But I attended Lawrence University, a liberal arts college in Wisconsin, and this really broadened my intellectual horizons. One professor there, Charles Brunig, got me extremely interested in history, and another professor, Michael Hiddle, got me interested in Russian history in particular. And then a Russian language professor, George Smalley, led a group of students, uh, that, including me, to the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe on a three-month summer camping trip. Um, oh, this my was- gosh. I can't even imagine. What year is this? This was in 1981. So it was the Brezhnev era. And, you know, at the time, I admit, I didn't even think it was possible for Americans to go to the Soviet Union. It it was behind the Iron Curtain and everything. But when I heard about this trip, I, I definitely wanted to go. And when we got there, I discovered that the Soviet Union was nothing like what I imagined, you know, based on um, Cold War propaganda. I'd expected a sort of Orwellian society, a hyper-modern system where everything was controlled and efficient, where all the people were highly disciplined, almost like automatons. And in fact, um, what I found was exactly the opposite. It was a relatively poor, undeveloped country. I remember driving from Leningrad to Moscow, that was a, a two-lane blacktop road. And somewhere around Novgorod, we had to stop because a herd of cattle was cra- crossing the road <laughs> and we were stuck for, <laughs> for 20 or 30 minutes. Um, but the people there, too, were nothing like the Cold War stereotypes. They were extremely friendly, very emotional and warm, very hospitable. So I really um, became fascinated with the Soviet Union, and I I decided to go on to graduate school in Russian history. So I uh, went to Columbia University. Um, Overall, it was not a great experience. The graduate student funding was kind of inadequate. The professors, not very helpful. The attrition rate was terrible. Most most of the graduate students dropped out without finishing. But I did make some good friends um, among my fellow graduate students. And I wrote a dissertation on peasant migration, working class formation in Moscow that eventually became my first book, Peasant Metropolis. Um, And then after I finished my PhD, I uh, 
I taught at Cornell University on a temporary appointment for two years and then got a tenure track position at Ohio State, which is where I've been ever since. Uh, so I, I did uh, additional work on Stalinism. I wrote a book on Stalinist cultural history. I did a monograph called Cultivating the Masses on Modern State Practices and Soviet Socialism. And I wrote a, a fourth monograph on the Stalinist era. Um, but then I got kind of tired of books on Stalinism. So I turned, <laughs> well, that's when I, I turned to this new project on the, the memory of World War II. Uh-huh. And tell us a little bit about how the book came came into being. How What was the in, original impetus to put the collection together? Yeah, so I, I've always found the memory of the past to be an intriguing topic. You know, th- when you think about it, the past is infinitely complex, and that means the vast majority of what happened in the past is forgotten. Only a fraction of the past is remembered and commemorated So that raises the question, why are certain things remembered and other things forgotten? And how is it that societies remember their past uh, through historical narratives, historical films, commemorative rituals, monuments, museums, and so forth? So this is an important subject of inquiry for historians. And it it, um, somewhat came out of a seminal article in the field of memory studies that was written by Pierre Nora. It was called Les Lieux de Memoir, The Sites of Memory. Nora's work really inspired um, many studies of memory in Western Europe, especially the memory of World War I and World War II. But until recently, there was relatively little scholarship on World War II memory in the Soviet Union and Russia. There were several pioneering works, for example, those by Nina Tumarkin, Amir Weiner, Lisa Kirschenbaum. But compared to the very rich literature that had developed by the 1990s on war and memory in Western Europe, there were relatively few books in our field. And that, I think, is surprising because World War II commemoration in the Soviet Union far surpassed that of any other country in the world. Uh, Now, though, it's changing. Um, There's a lot of exciting new research on World War II memory, I think, in part thanks to Vladimir Putin and the enormous emphasis that his government has placed on War remembrance. Uh, so the purpose of this volume is to sort of showcase some of that new research. And what I did was to solicit con- contributions from a wide range of scholars who are working on aspects of World War II memory in Russia. It's an international group of scholars, um, people who are located in Russia, Ukraine, Germany, Austria, Britain, France, Norway, as well as in the U.S. And these are scholars from a range of disciplines, from history, literature, film studies, political science, and sociology. The chapters cover war memory over time from the Stalin era all the way through the Putin era. So that also made it possible to compare both the similarities and the differences between the Soviet and post-Soviet periods. Yes, and I imagine putting them all into chronological order was was like a very complicated jigsaw puzzle, but it flows so beautifully, the collection, uh, in terms of chronology. It's, it's masterful. Mm-hmm. Thank you, yeah. Well, let's um, set the stage. I, I know that many of our listeners, if not all of our listeners, are familiar with the essential timeline of the Second World War, um, but maybe not so much about the, the highlights of the Soviet Union's entry into it and the major milestones of what happened. And I wonder if you could just walk us very quickly uh, through the Soviet Union's war experience. Yeah, sure, Jennifer. Let me let me just give a quick overview. So 1939 marked the beginning of World War II in Europe. That was the year that the Soviet Union signed a non-aggression pact with Nazi Germany. The pact contained secret protocols allowing Nazi Germany to invade Poland from the West, while the Soviet Union invaded Poland Uh, from the east, eastern Poland, uh, and then subsequently invaded the Baltic countries and part of Finland as well. And then in June of 1941, Nazi Germany broke broke that pact and launched a massive invasion of the Soviet Union. The beginning of the war was a disaster for the Soviet side. German forces drove deep into Soviet territory. And by September, Leningrad was virtually surrounded. Uh, It was the beginning of the siege of Leningrad that would last for the next two and a half years. By October 1941, 
German forces were approaching Moscow. Uh, and finally, in the Battle of Moscow, the Red Army was able to stop the German advance and even launch a counteroffensive that drove the German army back a little bit. But in the spring of 1942, the Germans launched a new offensive to the south. They drove all the way to the Volga River, and there the Battle of Stalingrad was fought. It was the largest battle in all human history. It went on for months. It involved brutal house-to-house fighting. Roughly one million soldiers were killed on each side. The Red Army was ultimately victorious. It not only held out against the German assault, but ultimately launched a counteroffensive that encircled a huge number of German troops. So this really was the turning point of World War II in Europe. From that time on, the German army was mostly in retreat, including after the Soviets won the Battle of Kursk in 1943. And then the Red Army was able to drive through Eastern Europe in 1944 and ultimately capture Berlin in May of 1945. So this was a tremendous victory for the Soviet Union, but it was won at a horrendous price. Some 27 million Soviets were killed during World War II. Much of the Western part of the country was destroyed. Entire cities were reduced to rubble. There were 20 million Soviets left homeless at the end of the, uh, the, end of the war. Um, so certainly this was an event of enormous trauma and loss and also a military victory of great historical importance. And from that perspective, it's not surprising that World War II is commemorated uh, in Russia today. But the fact that it was important does not really dictate how the war would be remembered, or the fact that even today, 75 years after the war ended, that war memorialization is still a central pillar of Russian national identity. Well, and that brings us uh, sort of into the the primary theme of the book. I I love this expression. Um, I, I can't quite remember who used it, but that the Putin administration has used the war as excellent cement. Um, you know, people who know Soviet studies know this how how important cement is. Um, but that this cement unites the Russians together. What is it about the war that provides this ability to bring everybody together? Right. Um, so a general theme of the volume is to look at the political utility of war memory. Um, And in fact, almost all studies of war commemoration show this regardless of of the country. The memory of the war reflects not just the events of the past, but also the political needs of the present. So in the early 2000s, at a moment when Russia had diminished international standing, the Putin government um, really fastened on World War II memory. It found it politically useful to recall and celebrate the World War II victory because this had been a time when the Soviet Union had played the leading role defeating Nazi Germany, a time when the Soviet Union emerged as a superpower that would rival the United States for world domination. So the Putin government used World War II memory to build Russian patriotism and unity. And this term you mentioned, excellent excellent cement. So this is actually a quote from Putin himself. Oh my goodness. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. In a 2011 speech, he called war memory, excellent cement to unite people into one indivisible Russian nation. Now, of course, you could still ask why today, 75 years after the war, is is war memory foundational for Russian unity? I mean, there are very few Russians who lived through the war who are still alive today. The vast majority of Russians have no personal memory of the war. So why does, we can ask, why does World War II memorialization continue to resonate with the Russian people? And I think it's due uh, to the fact that Soviet commemorative culture was so pervasive in education and public life for decades People were immersed in World War II memorialization and official narratives about the war. And this is illustrated really well by one of the chapters in the volume, the chapter by Olga Konka uh, called Teaching and Remembering the War in Soviet Schools. So Konka examines Soviet school primers and textbooks from the 1940s all the way through the 1980s. And what she finds is that all of the editions of told very much the same story. They all relied on the same periodization. 
They had the same heroes. Even after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the same war narratives continued to be used in school textbooks. And as Kuntke also shows, um, book, book learning in Soviet schools was augmented by school museums, field trips to monuments, and ceremonies to honor veterans. The speeches at these ceremonies all use the same phrases about ruthless invaders, heroism, unity, and self-sacrifice. The, incidentally, the very same phrases that are used today in commemorative speeches in Russia. So the, the Putin regime was able to draw on Soviet World War II narratives and rituals because these were so deeply ingrained and because they continue to resonate with the population. And in fact, this helps explain the strong continuities between Soviet and post-Soviet war memory. And that's one of the, the findings of the volume. Current Russian war memory draws extensively on the Soviet myths and symbols and rituals of the war. Uh, the master narrative of the war is largely the same as it was in Soviet times, uh, minus the leading role of the Communist Party. The mm -hmm. master narrative tells of uh, the fascist invader that was vanquished by the people's unity and the Red Army's heroism. All suffering is attributed to the enemy's ruthlessness, while leadership failures and popular panic are not mentioned. This story of heroism and sacrifice that resulted in triumph. Um, so there, there are important discontinuities as well between Soviet and post-Soviet war memory. We can get into those later maybe, but, but there's very striking thematic continuities between the Soviet and post-Soviet Soviet era. And I think, I think nowhere is that more prevalent than on May 9th. Um, and anyone who's been to Russia uh, for the Victory Holiday Parade um, can't help but, but understand how outsized this holiday is. Um, I've sat through the parade, I think probably 20 times. My husband is a former army officer and I lived in Russia for a couple of decades. Um, and I've seen the parade go from something quite modest to, to something really, really um, triumphant and takes several hours. Um, your, the book uh, really refers to May 9th again and again. And there's even an essay on, on the development of the parade. And I wonder if you could walk us through um, how May 9th evolved into the most important holiday uh, in Russia. Uh-huh. Yeah, sure, Jennifer. Yeah. And let me, um, so let me actually talk about two of the chapters that are, are relevant here. Uh, the first one by Misha Gabovich, um, titled Victory Day Before the Cult, for commemoration in the USSR 1945 to 65. So Gabovich challenges the widespread misconception that Victory Day was not celebrated before the Brezhnev era, in fact, it is true that in 1947, a decree made Victory Day a work day, and it only regained its status as a non-working holiday in 1965. But as Gabovich shows, Victory Day continued to be celebrated uh, from 1947 on. Even though people had to work, there were still rallies, speeches, exhibitions, graves were tended. There were ceremonies honor honoring veterans. There were lectures for school children. While the large memorial complexes um, remembering the war were only really completed in the Brezhnev era, before that, there were hundreds of smaller obelisks, tank monuments, and other memorials, especially in the western part of the country where most of the fighting had taken place. And on Victory Day, soldiers were taken on tours of these memorials. This was to inspire their patriotism and so forth. And so according to Gabovich, what distinguished the cult of World War II under Brezhnev was not so much new commemorative practices as a nationwide diffusion of rituals, uh, ceremonies, and so forth, honoring veterans. Um, rituals that had developed locally before 1965 and then became spread all across the country uh, during the Brezhnev era and beyond. The other chapter that speaks to Victory Day celebrations is um, by Ivan Porzgen, and it particularly focuses on parades um, and parades in Russian memory culture. So Porzgen highlights the prominence of the Victory Day parade in the commemoration of World War II. She discusses some of the background of military parades on Red Square. These, um, of course, predated the war. There were celebrations of the revolution, 
on November 7th and the May Day parades. The first victory parade was on June 24th, 1945, um, just a month and a half after the war ended. Uh, as poor skin shows, the parade um, did not at that time become an annual event. Victory Day parades were revived in 1965 and held, then held every five years. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, and then in the 1990s, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, all military parades were discontinued for a short time. But in 2005, Victory Day parades were revived as an annual event. This was part of the prominence that the Putin government was giving to World War II commemoration. And Borskin notes that current parades in Russia are modeled on Soviet parades. Um, Of course, most of the veterans of World War II have passed, but their place has been taken by what's called the Immortal Regiment. These are Mm -hmm. Russian citizens who march with portraits of their ancestors who took part in the war. This was initially a grassroots initiative, but it's now been co-opted by the Putin regime. And Putin himself has in fact marched with the immortal regiment carrying a portrait of his father, who was a World War II veteran. Mm -hmm. And I I know with interest of the last couple of years, we've seen the, the return of images of Stalin in the parades. Um, in a number of the essays in the book, he is a very awkward character um, in these essays, and no one quite knows to do, how to associate him with the drama of the Second World War. I know that Stalin is a major theme in your own academic work, and so I, would you tell us a little bit about what accounts for this awkwardness, and how does it play out over the decades and into our present day? Yes, yeah, so so it is um, awkward and has been for some time. Um, there's one chapter in the volume that uh, specifically addresses this, the chapter by Jan Mann, uh, situating Stalin in the history of the Second World War. Uh, he shows um, these tensions over how to characterize Stalin's role in the war. Uh, in Stalin's lifetime, of course, uh, he was extolled as a military genius. This was part of the Stalin cult that continued through the post-war Stalin years. But then... Under Khrushchev, there was a de-Stalinization campaign, and Stalin was denounced for failures of wartime leadership. Interestingly, as uh, Mann shows, even while Stalin was being denounced during the Khrushchev era, he was still often portrayed as larger than life. But instead of getting all the credit for the victory, he got all the blame for the mishaps uh, and setbacks during the war. Um, Mann describes how under Khrushchev, the Institute of Marxism-Leninism was charged with writing the official history of the war. And the aim was to give credit for the victory to the Communist Party instead of to Stalin, uh, part of getting rid of this, the Stalin cult. The historians found that, it was, that Stalin was sort of entwined in the history of the war. It was, you know, as you said, very awkward to deal with him. It was hard to to denounce him for all his failures without giving him at least some credit for the victory. Um, And then under Brezhnev, a new 12 volume history of World War II was published and it presented Stalin in a more favorable way. Now, Mann notes that um, this debate over Stalin's role continues in Russia to this day. In fact, it's very, the whole legacy of Stalin is very contentious issue politically, and his role in World War II is is part of that. But Ma notes that um, with the Putin government's veneration of the war, it's become almost impossible to separate Stalin from the wartime victory. Mm -hmm. And it's Stalin, isn't it, who um, first introduces the notion of Russian, ethnic Russians, as um, a kind of first among equals, uh, the notion of Russian exceptionalism, even during the war, which seems incredibly antithetical to the ideals of the diverse multinational USSR, um, sort of the the nation that brings all these different peoples together. I wonder if you could tease out how this comes about and, and how it's still very relevant today. Yes, uh, this is another important question, uh, and Stalin did um, mention in some of his wartime speeches, he did make appeals to uh, 
Russian national heroes of the past and so forth. Um, in this volume, uh, Jonathan Brunstedt addresses the question um, and looks um, at wartime mobilizational strategies, um, which sort of uh, involve this tension between Russian nationalism or Russian exceptionalism and um, sort of a broader pan-Soviet uh, appeal. Um, so uh, to put it another way, um, it's a tension between portraying the war as a Russian victory, a kind of second great patriotic war similar to the Napoleonic Wars versus a Soviet victory uh, to which all Soviet nationalities contributed. And this, of course, had important political implications um, because the Russian patriotic line elevated ethnic Russians over all the other nationalities, whereas a pan-Soviet approach promoted more of a friendship of Soviet peoples. As Brunstad shows, the tensions over how the war would be remembered actually began during the war itself. Soviet mm-hmm. propaganda sort of alternated between Russo-centric appeals, uh, including invoking these past Russian military heroes, versus a pan-Soviet patriotism that emphasized the strength of the Soviet system and the role of all the Soviet nationalities in fighting fasc- fascism. And the efforts to resolve these tensions were not very successful. After the war, uh, official accounts generally portrayed the war as a Soviet victory, not a purely Russian victory. Um, And they put emphasis on the strength of the Communist Party, Soviet industrial might, and the bond of all Soviet nationalities fighting together. But um, Brunstedt shows that the Russo-centric strains of World War II memory persisted and then once again took prominence um, after the end of the Soviet Union and during the Putin era. And the Putin government has portrayed World War II as a purely Russian victory. And in connection with this, I should mention another, another relevant chapter in the book, and that's a chapter by Olga Kucherenko, um, it's on Len Lease in War and Russian Memory. Um, so Kucherenko examines shifting Russian attitudes towards the history of Len Lease, Len Lease being the wartime program by which the United States and Britain sent military and economic aid to the Soviet Union. So in both the Soviet and post Soviet periods, official remembrance emphasized the exceptional nature of the Soviet war effort and downplayed British and American contributions through Lend-Lease. However, there have been some fluctuations in how prominently Lend-Lease has been remembered. As Kucherenko shows, these fluctuations have sort of depended on relations between the former wartime allies. uh, allies. So during the Cold War, uh, Soviet leaders were sort of loath to acknowledge wartime aid from the United States. But then, after the collapse of the Soviet Union for several years in the early 1990s, um, this is a time when Russian American relations were better, there was, in fact, greater acknowledgement of Len Lease. And there was even a monument built to commemorate Allies' World War II cooperation. But by the late 90s and certainly after 2000, when Putin became president of Russia, this Cold War era language sort of returned. The contribution of Lend-Lease to the Soviet war effort was once again minimized. And today, the Putin government recognizes Russia's role almost exclusively. Putin has stated that Russia bore the brunt of losses and won the war and has even said that we are the country of victors. So definitely portrayed as a purely Russian victory under Putin's government. Oh, dear. And I should say we're um, we're taping this in the end of January 2022, when um, tensions between America and Russia have, have really never been higher over the situation in Ukraine, which in the context of World War II seems insane. Um, but we'll just have to see how that plays out. Um, Another tension that emerges throughout the study um, is that of the gender tension between men and women. And your own essay in the book on um, gender representations in Soviet war memorials was particularly interesting to me. I used to work as a tour guide throughout the Soviet Union. 
I've spent a lot of time at each of the monuments you describe. Um, but I began to see them in a new way after your essay. Um, talk us through uh, your, your essay and, and the three memorials and how they present women um, in the war. Okay, sure. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so I was interested in representations of gender in Soviet war memorials, and I looked at the, some of the major war monuments, including the, for example, the Battle of Stalingrad Memorial. Um, so uh, just some background, during the war, a large number of women enlisted in the Soviet military. There were some 900,000 women that served in the Red Army or the Air Force, including 120,000 in combat positions. So there were female snipers, bomber pilots, anti-aircraft gunners, and one would expect some recognition of women's military service after the war. Instead, in the post-war period, women's military contributions were mostly ignored, and Soviet war memorials in particular depicted soldiers exclusively as men. There are no statues of female soldiers. Now, there are some female figures in these monuments. Um, At the Stalingrad Memorial, for example, there's an enormous statue of Mother Russia, but this is, of course, an allegorical figure. It's not representing any real Soviet women. Um, And there are a few other female statues in Soviet war memorials, but they show women only in traditional female roles as mothers in mourning, as nurses or as victims. Um, And this post-war erasure of women's military contribution extended to other forms of cultural remembrance as well. Um, For example, literature, films, history books, all of these downplayed or ignored women's military contributions. So in the chapter, I try to explain this. Um, I think it has to do with the fact that war for any society marks a rift a disruption of normal life due to wartime mobilization and loss. This was particularly true for the Soviet Union, given the enormous death and destruction of the Second World War. And the way that the war was remembered served to try to repair that rift, in this case, to reestablish societal norms. So war memorials acted to reestablish the pre-war gender order. This this gender order had been disrupted uh, during World War II, not only because women served in the military, but also because so many men had been killed or disabled. Of the the 27 million Soviets killed in the war, 20.5 million were men. Um, Many male veterans who survived were disabled. So this created at least a potential for a a crisis of masculinity after the war. But Soviet official culture, including these Soviet war monuments, sought to counteract that, sought to buttress male authority by portraying men as strong, heroic, and courageous, and meanwhile presenting women in traditional female roles, sort of subordinate to men, uh, particularly presenting women as mothers, um, in part to sort of promote the pronatalist drive, the drive to try to increase the population and get women to have more children after the war. So this had real consequences in that it reinforced traditional gender roles in the Soviet Union. The opportunity to further the goal of gender equality was lost. Instead of presenting women as comrades in arms with men, post-war commemoration presented them as victims, as nurses, or as mothers in mourning. And and the women seem okay with that? Well, no, not necessarily. Um, but women were not, of course, the ones designing these monuments. They were designed exclusively by, by men. That's interesting. How do you, do you think you're seeing any kind of change um, in the present day? Yeah, interestingly, there's, there's um, today greater interest in women's role uh, roles in the war. Um, and maybe we can get into that more later, but, um, but it, it's definitely um, d- different than, than this, the immediate post-war era when there was this real effort to try to reinforce traditional gender roles. Right. Well, and, and another um, sort of, my, not minority, but um, a different points of view is really well represented. I was delighted to see 
that the collection included a look at how the war is covered in Russia's regions as opposed to the major urban centers. Um, Tatiana Zhurzhenko's excellent essay uh, covering Veliki Novgorod and Murmansk was particularly good, I thought, in um, bringing that to light. To what extent um, does, does the memory of World War II vary from one city or locality or region to the other, do you think? Yeah, this is, um, I found very interesting. Uh, you know, one might expect that there'd be a certain uniformity in um, Soviet and Russian war remembrance, uh, because Soviet official culture especially was a product of a hyper-centralized um, system. But uh, there have been some previous studies, um, those by Lisa Kirschenbaum and Vicki Davis, that have shown that in Leningrad and Novorossiysk, there are some very unique aspects to war memorialization. And um, the, the articles, the chapters in this volume that examine local war commemoration have similar findings. Uh, the chapter by Tatiana Georgenko that you mentioned, and also the chapter by Carl Qualls. Um, so the one by Qualls actually looks at war memorialization in Sevastopol, both in the Soviet and the, the post-Soviet period. And Qualls shows that local traditions uh, in Sevastopol were quite strong, that war remembrance there highlighted unique features of the city and the city's war experience. Um, in particular, Soviet war monuments in Sevastopol connected uh, what were called the two great defenses of the city uh, of the Crimean War and World War II and emphasized the role the city played in defending the Russian homeland. So during the reconstruction of Sevastopol after World War II, um, streets were renamed um, after the heroes of the Crimean War as well as after uh, heroes of World War II. And in 1955, uh, a centennial celebration of the Crimean War, Khrushchev came to Sevastopol and praised the military feats of the glorious sons of our great motherland. So as Qualls, as Qualls shows, um, even after the collapse of the Soviet Union, this narrative of Sevastopol as a defender of Russia continued, despite the fact that Sevastopol at, by, at, at that point was part of Ukraine after the the collapse of the Soviet Union. It was part of Ukraine. It was still being portrayed as a defender of Russia. And that had important political consequences because it meant that when Putin seized Crimea in 2014, he could praise Sevastopol's long history of defending Russia, sort of relying on this rhetoric that it had been developed over the preceding 70, 70 years. Uh, so this, in, in a way, facilitated Rus Russia's seizure and annexation of Crimea because Sevastopol all along had been portrayed as a city of Russian military glory from both, both the Crimean War and World War II. Um, but let, me, let me turn to Zhurzhenko's um, chapter. So Tatyana Zhurzhenko looked at World War II memories in two provincial cities, Veliki Novgorod and Murmansk, uh, and she shows strong continuities in war remembrance from the Soviet to the post-Soviet period. She argues that local political leaders in both cities have presented themselves as guardians of patriotic war memory. Uh, she, and she also shows that war memorialization has been used to teach local as well as national patriotism. So the roles that these cities played in World War II has been highlighted in order to raise the profile of these cities. Uh, and incidentally, it's not just these two provincial cities. The Putin government has awarded 45 cities with the title uh, City of Military Glory. Um, so interestingly, um, Zhurzhenko has found uh, for Veliki Novgorod and Murmansk that um, the World War II memory there has been um, certainly highlighted, sort of the unique facets of the local history emphasized. But she also found that um, the, the war memory has been more pluralistic and less politicized in provincial cities than in the center. And she explains this as due to the fact that, that non-governmental organizations have 
been involved to a greater degree, religious organizations, professional associations, including those of historians, archaeologists, and architects, as well as the local media. All of these have played an important role in historical commemoration. Mm-hmm. Well, and I, you know, it's interesting with um, Sevastopol, um, which has really kind of sort of jumped onto the big screen. Um, there's this blockbuster film uh, about Sevastopol, and, and this is covered very well in the book um, on the chapter with chapters, I should say, about films and um, literature surrounding the war. How has how have these contributed to the the collective war memories, and how is that changing uh, in the present day? Yeah, so um, there have been um, obviously both uh, writers and filmmakers have um, contributed enormously to the memory of the war, um, and uh, including this film Battle for Sovasopol. Let me come back to that in a minute because I. I wanted first to talk a little about literature and the role that it's played, you know, in war commemoration. Um, and so uh, the, there's a chapter by Angela Brintlinger uh, called Veterans Remember the War in Soviet and Post-Soviet Fiction. So Brintlinger looks at three writer veterans, uh, Bulat Akujava, Viktor Astafiev, and Vasil Buikow. All of them served in the Red Army as young men and then in the post-war era, wrote fiction and memoirs depicting the war. And what's really fascinating about Brintlinger's chapter is that she looks at how these authors' representations of the war changed over time. In the immediate post-war period, the fiction they wrote was sentimentalized in keeping with Soviet domestic politics. Then in the Khrushchev era, they and other authors sought a more authentic picture of the war, writing what was sometimes called lieutenant's prose about life in the trenches. Um, But this was still not the full story of the war. Only near the end of their lives, uh, with Glasnost under Gorbachev and then the end of the Soviet Union, only then was censorship fully lifted. And these authors were able to sort of give give what they really thought about the war in their writings. In their last writings, these authors questioned the glory of the war and depicted instead suffering, injustice, and loss. Now, Brindlinger's chapter also touches on an important issue in memory studies, namely the relationship between individual and collective memory. In some cases, Red Army veterans' individual memories came to dovetail with official narratives about the war. They, mm, yes. <laughs> it, it, which is interesting, you know, they seem to forget all the negative aspects of the war, the blunders, the repression. Instead, they repeated official platitudes about the Red Army's bravery and so forth. And to, to understand that, um, it's helpful to consider the ideas of Maurice Hallblox, uh, whom Brintlinger discusses uh, in her chapter. Uh, Hallblox, in many ways, is the founder of studies of collective memory. Paul Box posited that all memory is essentially social. So in contrast to Sigmund Freud, Paul Box argued that people's memories cannot be purely individual because they are formed through communication with others. So Paul Box saw individual memories as reflecting master narratives in society. And recent neurological research actually supports Paul Box ideas. Um, what neurologists have found is that the process by which information is stored in people's long-term memory involves physiological changes in neural networks. And these changes actually require rehearsal uh, and also meaningful association. So this fundamentally associative nature of human memory means that people's recollections are shaped by the narratives that they have heard. So this is what happened in some cases when Soviet veterans sort of subsumed their personal memories to official narratives about the war. But interestingly, that did not happen in every case, certainly not in the cases of the writers that Brintlinger analyzed. So these writer veterans ultimately rejected the master narrative of the Great Patriotic War. In the 1990s, Akujava stated that there was great suffering, but there was no great war. So we can see that the the entire Soviet population did not adopt a uniform, you know, collective memory of the war. Um, Interesting. 
Yeah. Uh-huh. Let me, but hmm. let me also um, turn to what you asked about Jennifer regarding the films and filmmakers, because as you said, there, there are two chapters in the volume that address this. Um, one chapter is uh, by Stephen Norris, um, which looks at a number of recent war films um, and looks at memory politics in Putin's Russia as well. So um, Norris um, points out that Putin's Minister of Culture from 2012 to 2020 was Vladimir Medinsky, and he made a concerted effort to promote patriotic war films. And one of those films was the Battle for Sevastopol that you um, uh, referred to a minute ago. So the Battle for Sevastopol was based on the life of Lumila Pavlichenko, the famous sniper, famous female sniper, who had over 300 confirmed kills during the war. So this is indeed an interesting contrast with what I discussed in my chapter when in you know the post-war Soviet era, um, women's military contributions were not acknowledged. Now, in fact, they, they are being acknowledged, being acknowledged. This, this 2015 film uh, glorified female combatants in their patriotism. Um, so I think that's extremely interesting. Norris also discusses several other recent Russian films, um, including some about the siege of Leningrad. One of the films he analyzes is Saving Leningrad, a uh, 2019 action film by Alexei Kozlov. Uh, and he also discusses a 2018 film by Konstantin Khabensky called Sobibor. So Sobibor tells a true story of a Jewish Red Army soldier who was captured and sent to a Nazi death camp. There he organized a successful revolt that killed Nazi guards and 300 pr- prisoners escaped, including this Jewish soldier, uh, Alexander Pachursky. And Norris um, calls this a patriotic Holocaust film, which I think is a very apt uh, name for it um, because it's a Jewish hero, but he's also a Red Army soldier who is fighting against the Nazis. Uh, And it's noteworthy that the Holocaust does figure prominently in recent Russian cinema. Um, And that's analyzed in the other chapter in the volume on film, this one by Adrienne Harris. Her chapter is titled Jews, Gender, and Just Wars, Remembering and Rewriting the Great Patriotic War in 2015 Films. So Harris examines the portrayal of the war in um, several films, including... Uh, the film The Young Guard. This was actually shown as a 12-part miniseries. The Young Guard is based on the story of young Soviet partisans fighting the Nazis in occupied Ukraine. The story was first popularized in post-war Stalin era by, in a novel by Alexander Fedeyev. Um, but this is sort of a retelling of the story This in this 2015 miniseri- miniseries by Leonid Kiaskin. Um, and it's another example of the Holocaust figuring prominently in recent, recent Russian war memory. But unlike the film Sobibor, uh, here the Jewish characters are not heroic fighters. Instead, they're portrayed as uh, helpless victims. They're civilians who are rescued by the Red Army. And Harris illustrates the political utility of this film and the other films she analyzes. She um, because these films show the Red Army soldiers, <clears throat> excuse me, as protectors of the Jews, um, and portrays Ukrainians as collaborating with the Nazis in the persecution of Jews. Um, so, in the context of Russia's 2014 military intervention in Ukraine, this certainly mobilized public sentiment behind Russian military actions. Right. And this is this is not the only place in which um, in the book where the Holocaust is sort of um, reexamined, uh, not only not only in the context of war memory, but almost almost politicized um, in, in the current um, in the current day by the particularly the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, can you walk us through that? Because that, that to me was just mind boggling. Yes, yes. This is especially um, interesting. And it's addressed by the in this chapter by Anton Weisvent, 
uh, on Holocaust, Holocaust, Holocaust discourse in Putin's Russia. Um, so, uh, l- but let me give a little background because in the Soviet period, the Holocaust was entirely left out of official war memory. <clears throat> this has been studied previously by scholars such as V. Gittleman and Amir Viner. Soviet officials did not recognize Jewish suffering as distinct. They did not want the Holocaust to overshadow the losses of the Soviet people as a whole. And in Soviet accounts, any mention of Holocaust massacres were described as a fascist murder of civilians. There was no acknowledgement that the victims were Jewish. But in the post-Soviet era, the Holocaust has become an important part of war memory. So this is a a major discontinuity between the Soviet um, and post-Soviet eras. In fact, uh, let me just mention the, the other main discontinuities are the fact that the role of the Communist Party in leading the country to victory is no longer highlighted the way it was in the Soviet era. And the role of the Russian Orthodox Church has become extremely important in war commemoration in post-Soviet Russia. It was, of course, um, not uh, that was not true in the Soviet period. But um, back to this question, why is it that the Putin government has made the Holocaust such a prominent part of World War II remembrance. So in this chapter, uh, Weisswendt looks at how Holocaust discourse has been used by Putin as a Russian foreign policy tool. Uh, He points out that making the Holocaust part of Russian World War II memory serves several foreign policy goals. Uh, First of all, improving relations with Israel. Israel, of course, um, wanting and expecting acknowledgement of the Holocaust, which was not given, as I said, during the Soviet era. So um, the Putin government now acknowledging the Holocaust and also highlighting the Red Army's leading role defeating the Nazis. So this implicitly is sort of saying that Russia and Israel are are on the same side in in terms of opposing fascism. But um, Mm -hmm. in addition... The Putin government has used the Holocaust or the memory of the Holocaust to criticize the past of the Baltic countries and of Ukraine. The Russian foreign ministry has invoked the Holocaust to condemn Nazi collaborators in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Ukraine. The Russian delegation to the United Nations has even sponsored resolutions condemning fascists in Latvia for participating in the Holocaust. And in the aftermath of Russia's military intervention in Ukraine in 2014, Putin condemned Bandera and Ukrainian nationalists for collaborating with the Nazis in the Holocaust. So as Vice Fent concludes, the Putin government is really using the memory of the Holocaust to gain leverage in foreign affairs. Hmm. Well, let's turn to Putin himself. Um, I thought that Elizabeth Wood's uh, excellent essay exploring the ways in which he's woven his own particular family story into the war was was the perfect way to open part three of the book, which brings things into the the modern era with representations of the war during Putin's long um, presidential administration. And she notes that right from the beginning, um, he associated his presidency with a respect for veterans, uh, frequent visits to memorials and later churches and concern for um, modern day officers. Um, How has this strategy sort of bolstered his power, do you think? Yes, so certainly it's it's true that um, he and his administration have used this to try to bolster his his power and popularity. Uh, Elizabeth Wood points out that it's um, somewhat surprising that Putin attaches himself to the image of World War II because Putin, of course, was not born until after the war. He was born in 1952. Um, but despite this, as, as you said, Jennifer, Putin has emphasized his connections to the war and identified as a, his official persona with World War II commemoration. So part of this was um, from the time he was first inaugurated as Russian president in 2000, he's marked virtually every anniversary of the war's major battles. He's met with veterans and made visits to memorials and churches to sanctify those killed in the war. Um, Putin has also uh, 
accentuated his personal connections to the war, highlighting the fact that his father was wounded as a Red Army soldier fighting outside Leningrad, and the fact that his older brother died during the siege of Leningrad. Mm -hmm. Uh, Putin has also appeared at a boarding school for girls who are daughters of military officers. He sort of presented himself as a father figure to the students there, led them in patriotic songs, um, and showed his concern for the military in this way as well. So in all these ways, Putin has bolstered his standing by associating himself with Russia's military glory and by acting as kind of the protector of the memory of the war. At the end of her chapter, uh, Wood asks if the cult of Putin in World War II may have reached its limits. She notes um, this curious case uh, when the Cathedral of Russian Armed Forces was being completed (laughs) in 20... (laughs) I'm sorry, it's just just so outrageous, this cathedral. Can you describe it for our listeners? Because not, maybe not everybody um, knows what it looks like. Right, right. Yeah. So this is an, an, an enormous cathedral built uh, in Kubinka out near Moscow. Um, and it's a special cathedral of the Russian armed forces. Uh, and so there was actually a plan to include a mosaic of Putin in the cathedral itself, um, you know, usually you, you expect mosaics of, of saints, uh, religious figures, but Putin was going to be um, in one of the mosaics in the cathedral. But when the plan for this uh, mosaic was leaked, there was an outcry, and the mosaic actually had to be taken down before the cathedral was opened later that year, later in 2020. Um so this, I guess, was in fact going too far to, to have a mosaic of Putin in the Cathedral of Russian Armed Forces. Um, but apart from this, Putin has been able to portray himself as a defender of Russian war memory and uh, as a defender of Russia itself. So I think in, in that sense, it, his uh, efforts have been fairly successful. He hasn't peaked yet. Maybe not. We'll have to Maybe see. not. <laughs> though, though I have to say, I left Russia in 2017, and I was blissfully ignorant of something that was going on um, that was being built, which is this sort of national franchise of history museums called Russia, My History, which Karen Patron covers in the final essay of the book. Um, quite illuminating, I think, to have sort of like the McDonald's franchise of history um, throughout many, many cities in Russia. Will you share with us what these are and how what they say about the ongoing use uh, of war memory as a political tool in Russia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, Jennifer. Yeah. So, um, you know, museums, of course, are kind of a quintessential site of memory and state run history museums are often sites where governments will put forward a political, politically useful version of the past. So um, Karen Patron looks at the Russia My History Museum, which is kind of an extreme example of a national museum promoting a single narrative of a country's history. Um, it's, it's, as you say, not a single single museum. It's, uh, it's 23 branches of this museum in cities all across the country. All the branches have identical main exhibits, Um, So this presents this sort of uniform narrative about Russia's history. And the exhibits cover the entire span of Russian history from earliest times to the present. Now, Patron argues that the Russia My History Museum seeks to create an atmosphere of national belonging for Russians, and that this museum places World War II memory at the very center of its efforts to build allegiance to the Russian nation. In the museum, exhibits, World War II is shown as a moment of national unity that made the country strong. Uh, And in this way, the museum seeks to protect its kind of canonical narrative of the war, uh, protect it from accounts that might diminish the glory of the wartime victory. Interestingly, in addition Mm -hmm. to putting a spotlight on the Second World, World War, the museum also includes an exhibit on Putin's safeguarding of World War II memory. In other words, it presents Putin's commemoration of the war as a historical event in its own right, and it implies that Russians have found unity under Putin 
just as they did during the war. As Patron shows, the overarching narrative of the museum is that unity is essential to protect the country from foreign foes, and World War II memory is at the center of this narrative. Fascinating. (laughs) And it sounds like these are very um, slick, multimedia, very digitalized um, places, which I was intrigued to learn are set inside leisure centers or or parts of the cities um, where people would go with their kids, um, parks and recreation centers. Uh, The one in Moscow is at Beden Ha, which just got an enormous facelift. Um, So it's really encouraging people to continue their education, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Right, right. I guess guess the idea is really to make these sort of almost a vacation destination so that the people will go there, enjoy themselves, but then also, you know, learn this story of Russia's history and particularly the the story of World War II and the, the patriotism that it might inspire. And as, as I think one of the, the essays said, get ready for the next cycle um, of conflict mm-hmm. um, that is sure, you know, at, is sure to come. Um, right, as right. They say. Part, part well, of the fact- message really is that, you know, Russian unity is important to protect the country against external enemies. So that's, that, uh, of course, is a message that fits very well with the uh, history of World, World War II. Indeed. Well, it's a, it's a fascinating book, and it, it really unlocks a, a lot of the mindset of the Russian people that I think for many, uh, many foreigners, uh, non-Russians, is, can be baffling. But I think you've really given us a, a, a keen insight into what the mindset is and how important this war memory is to Russia. So I, I highly recommend this, this book, and I hope that it enjoys great success. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for, for talking with me about it. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure. And can before we go, can you um, update us on what's next for you, what you're working on, if you can share anything? Sure. Yeah, I, I do have a couple book projects in mind. Um, one is on the construction of gender in Soviet history. This is mm. uh, a topic I've been interested in for a long time. I've written several articles on it, but I'd like to do a broader book that kind of brings together that work as well as other existing scholarship on the construction of masculinity and femininity in Soviet history. Um, And then my other project is um, to look at the history of socialism more generally. I've noticed among my undergraduate students, there's enormous interest in socialism, but they don't really have any clear idea what socialism is. And simultaneously, there are a lot of right-wing commentators in the U.S. who are constantly invoking socialism as a threat, mm. Um, mm. you know, as if Democrats and their quote-unquote radical socialist agenda will lead to gulag prison camps or something like that. So I feel like there's a greater uh, need for a greater understanding of the history of socialism and the, ver- the variety of forms that it has taken. Um, so my book will include looking at Soviet socialism, which is, of course, one form of Marxian socialism. Soviet socialism did, of course, include enormous state violence in the gulag. Um, But I'll ask whether these things derive from socialist ideology. One of my previous books, Cultivating the Masses, Modern State Practices in Soviet Socialism, actually showed that many features of Soviet socialism were based on practices of governance that originated outside the Soviet Union. But the book is also going to look at socialist systems in Eastern Europe, in Asia, Africa, Latin America, plus looking at forms of democratic socialism in Western Europe, looking at the kibbutz movement in Israel. So the goal is to show show in the enormous range of forms that socialism has taken and to try to get away from this sort of reified notion that socialism was just one particular political or social system. Oh, this sounds incredibly timely, incredibly necessary right now. So I hope you'll get it done and come back and talk to us about it. Okay, sure. Yeah, I'd be glad to. (laughs) And um, the memory of the Second World War in Soviet and post-Soviet Russia is out by Rutledge this year and available, I'm sure, where great books are sold. And um, how can our listeners find out more about you on the internet? Well, I do not have a 
personal web page, but I, uh, I or website, but I do have a page on the Ohio State History Department's website, so so listeners can certainly find me there. Okay, and we'll certainly link that in the show notes. Well, thank you very much, Professor Hoffman, for spending so much time with us and talking about war memory of the Second World War in Russia and the Soviet Union. Well, thank you, Jennifer. It's been a real pleasure. And as I said, I've really enjoyed listening to your podcast and all the podcasts on the New Books Network. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to our listeners for joining us today on the New Books in Russia and Eurasian Studies. I'm your host, Jennifer Yeremeyeva. I'll be back very soon to discuss another excellent new book with its author. And I'll see you then. Thank you for listening.